Nicholas computer. I think we're recording now. Yeah. So, zooming in this evening from Barcelona. Uh, welcome, Bernard Font, and you're going to be asking, why do we sit? What motivation is there to be ethical? And how do we prevent self-compassion from turning into self-pity? Um, so let's see what Bernard has to say, if you have any questions. Now, for you, you everybody who's watching this and everybody here today, uh, at One Mindful Breath, Bernard Font is the energy behind the Spanish language secular Buddhist website, Buddhis, BuddhismoSecular.org. He runs a secular Buddhist group in Barcelona and holds an MA in Buddhist studies from the University of South Wales. I said South West England, so I was a little bit mm. off the mark there. Now, Bernard has published a number of excellent CDs as a jazz pianist, and these are available from his website at bernardfont.com. So, without much further ado, welcome to New Zealand, welcome to Wellington. I will put you down like that so you can see people. And over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Ramsey. Um, I'll see if I can really answer all those questions in about 15 minutes. So um, I'll see what I can do and I'll start speaking. And if I don't have time to cover everything, I'll just hint at the other questions and really try to engage in some discussion. Um, the topic for the talk and what answers for me these questions recently is the concept of self-respect. And self-respect might sound a little old-fashioned to some people. I think we tap into something in our own cultural DNA that is also there in the earliest Buddhist texts. And recently I've been preferring the word self-respect to self-compassion. And maybe some will resonate with me, maybe some people prefer self-compassion. So um, the idea came to me um, quite recently, I've been toying with the idea. I was in Burma in January, and before I went to a monastery where I, where I spent a, a month practicing, I went into a little bookshop in Yangon, and I purchased a copy of the Dhammapada, which is a very famous uh, text in the Theravada tradition, which are little aphorisms. And I bought one, because I had learned the Burmese script and I wanted to read and practice a little bit also in the monastery. And one day in the monastery, I opened the Dhammapada just randomly and it landed on the opening page of the chapter on the self. And what's interesting about that chapter is that it's full of affirmative statements and positive statements about self. And we're rather used to thinking that Buddhism teaches there is no such thing as a self. Well, in the earliest texts, besides that teaching of not self, there's an important thread of positive and affirmative statements on the self. Mm -hmm. And that's quite surprising. And I knew that already, but it, it struck me. And the main themes are to love the self, and to tame the self. And to me, this combination is why we sit. We don't sit because we want to have a worse life, at least that's not why I do it. But at the same time, we recognize that wanting to have a good life is not um, equivalent to just self-indulging and just saying yes to anything that our petty desires tell us we need to somehow educate ourselves. Um, so the first verse of that chapter says, if you love yourself, protect yourself well. Also, some of the last uh, words from the Buddha before dying were that we should take self as our only refuge. And one of the things are here which is important to know is that the original in the in the language called Pali is ambiguous because in that language yourself myself himself is all the same word oneself and it's the word self so I could just translate if you love the self or if you love yourself and that's an interesting ambiguity is you can it really sounds different if I say that you should have yourself 
as your only refuge, or you should have the self as the only refuge. But the original language is just the same sentence. So here is where I get the topic of self-respect, of loving and taming the self. I, I recently found an article from Vogue magazine in 1961, written by a journalist named Joan Didion, titled On Self-Respect. And she says this, she says, although to be driven back upon oneself is an uneasy affair at best, rather like trying to cross a border with borrowed credentials, it seems to me now the one condition necessary to the beginnings of real self-respect. I think the main idea behind this quote and also all those passages about the self in the early Buddhist texts is that we have a relationship with ourselves. It's a very short distance relationship. It's a shortest distance relationship, but it is a relationship. Sort of as if we were splitting ourselves in two and saying that one has a relationship with the other. And I think Buddhism does this very often. It plays with changing the land between um, the personal and the interpersonal. And just as sometimes we might want to uh, empathize with someone and we imagine ourselves in their shoes, so we effectively delete the distance and we try to become that person and imagine how that person feels. Some other texts suggest that we do the opposite with ourselves, that we treat ourselves like two people and one is taking care of the other, but of course of the same person. So we want to help ourselves, but we also want to learn how to accept help from ourselves which is personally something I have more difficulty with uh, sometimes, to accept help even from, from myself. So that relationship um, we have with ourselves needs to be a healthy relationship. One of the reasons, because it then forms the basis for shared humanity, for empathy, for recognizing how just as I want well-being and I don't uh, want to suffer and others feel the same way, therefore, maybe I should not harm others. That's the golden rule. We also find it in, in Buddhist texts in some very short conversation between the king and his queen. And basically, the queen asks the king, who do you love most in the world? expecting that the queen will reply, oh, you, king, I love you most in the world. But the queen answers, I love myself most in the world. Or I love the self most in the world. But isn't this the same for you, king? And the king has to admit he loves himself most in the world. And then the king is confused, and the king goes to the Buddha and explains the story. And the Buddha, instead of uh, criticizing the couple for being selfish or anything, he turns it around and makes that basic act of self-love the basis for empathy, saying uh, exactly this, just as you feel this way, everybody else feels the same way. Therefore, treat others kindly. The reason I prefer this idea of respect, self-respect, or even self-love to self-compassion, um, it's just probably cultural connotations, and I'd like uh, in some minutes to hear about you and how you feel about this world also. But to me, it suggests too much self-pity. It slides into self-pity, I think, for me, too easily. It's very focused on pain. So, you don't have self-compassion for yourself when you're feeling happy. But you, you do maintain self-respect for yourself when things are going well. So it's broader, it's more inclusive. And I find self-compassion sometimes even a little bit self-condescending. 
So my most compassionate moments, personally, are not those that I say, oh, well, this happened to me. Oh. The most compassionate moments for me are when I say, okay, come on, that's enough. Let's do something about it. So I basically treat myself like an adult, uh, or at least I try to. And so, so I just want to give you some examples um, of how I try to practice this self-respect, both in hard times and in good times. So in hard times, um, I practice self-respect by allowing, giving myself space, and an important word for me is patience, is to have patience for a process of grieving or a process of uncertainty or any difficulty, to have patience for the process, as if I'm taking care of it, and to have the patience sometimes to stay with questions for which I do not have answers, to have the patience to stay with the difficulty um, and not rush it, and to just allow it space, give rain. I try not to fall into self-pity. And then the, the reason, the problem with self-pity to me is that it forgets that things can change. So self-demand says that things should already be different now. And I should have done that because I'm better and I shouldn't have said that and I should be different right now. It doesn't give any time. It's, it wants immediacy. On the other hand, <clears throat> self-pity mourns the problem as if it was going to last forever. And that's not very kind in a way. It's not holding hope. So, um, one example I had on retreat this January was um, like anyone who has done some retreat knows, in especially longer retreats, one has to handle ups and downs of enthusiasm and energy. And there's moments when it's just difficult and you just want to switch off. You go like, oh, I have enough of just watching the breath or I have enough of just being aware of myself and watching this movie of all my thoughts and you want to switch off and you have to keep going. So in the way I try to respect that is by respecting both my difficulty and my deeper commitment. So I don't switch off because I respect the fact that this is important to me and I took a flight of 10 hours to go to Burma and do all these things. But I also re respect the fact that I have limitations and I have moments of difficulty and I should not stretch it. Also recently, I had some bad days and I wrote uh, this on my journal. I wrote, naturally, my mind is spinning about this issue. I understand it. But the spinning makes me no good. Therefore, I must stop the spin. I must not feed the spinning. But I must not punish myself if I catch my mind naturally spinning around about this issue, because I understand it. Um, so this gives you a, an idea of how I approach self-respect in bad times. Then in good times, and this is where it differs from self-compassion because we don't think of self-compassion when things are going well. I try to respect myself when things are going well by something that sounds very simple, but I don't think it's easy at all, which is just to appreciate that things are going well. Just to appreciate um, my own virtues, to appreciate my own good qualities and not excusing them not justifying them, not explaining them away, not saying, oh yeah, yeah. I have this talent, but just, just, but just because of this or that, or just everyone can do this, or this just happened because of luck, and this is, and it's, no, it's um, not excusing these things, not finding excuses, just appreciating what is good, 
either something that happened that is good or something I did that is good or some ability I have that is good. And then trying to stay in the present and not um, compromise the moment by what worrying about whether it's going to last or secretly deciding that this is going to last and going, ah, I reached that. That's going to be eternal now. That's going to last forever. And therefore I, I start planting the seeds for future appointment. That's not respecting myself in that moment. Because I'm just flying away from the fact that things are good now. So um, this concept for me tries to avoid both chronic insufficiency, the idea that I'm never good enough, but also chronic complacency. And the gist of it, as I've said already, is to be compassionate for myself, of course, but while also holding a vision for myself and having confidence in my abilities. I think when self-confidence is absent, then it becomes massage. When there is a vision for improvement, it becomes physiotherapy. Where, where you know the limits of your body and your physiotherapist tells you, just stretch this, but respect the pain, respect the body. But it doesn't say don't do the exercises. Because it's not just about softening, softening the fibers. It's about stretching them but in the right measure, but they can stretch. And, and this is the point. Otherwise, there's no use in just sitting and meditating or reflecting on any of this. So self-compassion as, as a word or as an idea doesn't uh, suggest that much confidence to me. I think it's kind of lost in the idea. Perhaps it's just my own perception of the world, but it is captured for me more vividly in the world's self-respect. And I won't say much more because, um, yeah, I've spoken for about 15 minutes. Um, just Joan Didion in that article, has, you can find it on the internet. It's called On Self-Respect. It's very interesting and it's very well written. So um, she describes self-respect as a well-lit back alley where the charms that work for others don't work for yourself. Basically, you know the reasons why you do things. You can't fool yourself. You can try, but sooner or later you have to face that. Um, but basically, she sees respect as not wallowing in self-pity and taking the consequences of one's act. And the text is quite unapologetic and doesn't question the motivation for acting very much. That's where I disagree a little bit. And the notion in early Buddhism that I think is also interesting is that self-respect is the basis for ethics also because um, since you can anticipate the consequences of your acts and you want to take care of your future self, then you, this guides your behavior and what you decide you avoid doing and what you do engage in. And this future self is basically like another person. And so you try to treat that future self with respect. Uh, and try to uh, build a better next year, a better next month, a better next week. Also, um, this is to me the basis of ethics for oneself and for others, because the future self is effectively another person, and so you treat other persons the same way that you want to treat your future self and your present self. It's all that dialogue with the king and the queen that I spoke about a few minutes ago. But also because you hold a good standard for yourself and you want to have a good self-image. It's not for what others think and it's not for the consequences of one's act, though of course these are important. But another motivation 
it's just that since you love and respect yourself, you hold a good vision for what you can be. And when you fall short of it, you fall short of it, especially to your own eyes. And you know that you could have been better. Not to beat yourself up, but because you hold this vision for yourself. So just to wrap things up, um, to me, practice is an act of self-care. It's inspired by self-respect, but it's just like a balancing act, like two acrobats, where taking care of yourself is basically a way also to take care of others through your interactions with them, so that you improve yourself and uh, in this way, this reverberates to others. And at the same time, this reciprocity means that taking care of others directly is also a way of taking care of yourself. So these are, these are my thoughts on the topic. Um, I hope it made sense and I hope you found it interesting and I would really like to hear from you yeah. now. We have about 10, I could stretch it to, yeah, 15 minutes for comments, questions, and engaging in some more dialogue. Uh, thank you, Bernat. That was very interesting. And greetings to Lorna in Cardiff in Wales. Sorry, you got a little bit late. Um, yes, me too. <laughs> um, we'll throw this open to the floor and just ask if anybody has any questions. Lorna, could you put your... Uh, yourself on mute until you want to say something. I will. Bottom left hand corner. Thank you. So, anybody got any questions, go and sort of kneel in front of the altar, the shrine of the <laughs> back book, mm. and then you can ask the first question. Well, or any comments, anything you want to say, really. Oh, questions. There you go. Hi, Bernard. Hi. Um, I've got a question for you, and I guess it's just in the context of the origins of self-compassion, because if I, I guess, think about it in my, like just coming into Buddhism, it derives from self-awareness and therefore compassion seems to be a word that potentially helps absolve the ego in relation to um, or in paradox to self-respect potentially, because I guess respect for me in that context, I think, I think it's a really interesting thing you raised. Self-respect for me perhaps leans into the ego a little bit, whereas compassion is the acknowledgement of self-respect and the, still the kind of the dissolving of the ego. So I guess it feels like there's a little bit of a conflict if you consider self-awareness to be the origins of self-compassion. Does that make sense? Um, well, I think the words also resonate differently with different people. Mm. So, um, and I guess, com the use of compassion comes from all the emphasis on Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism on compassion and then apply it to oneself, which apparently is something that the Asian teachers were very surprised about when they came to the West. And the traditional practices for kindness, friendliness, or yeah, um, what they call loving kindness usually, they start with oneself because that's the easiest, right? Mm. <laughs> And, and, and in traditional Asian cultures, apparently that's just a given. Self-love is a given. Therefore, you model the, re you model the rest on self-love. The fact that you, you just treat yourself well. But we don't. So uh, a lot of people start with a dear person and you come to yourself later because we have more complicated relationships to ourselves. Mm. Um, so I understand your concern that self-respect has another danger, which is just to fall on the affirming and reaffirming oneself in a solidified way. Mm. But 
I think perhaps we should also consider just losing the fear of talking about self. Because the Buddha never said that there is no self. In fact, affirming, claiming that there is no self is considered one of the six wrong views about the self. Mm. I think it's um, the ideas of dissolving the ego, depending on the context, can be either very helpful or very vague language where I don't really know what it means. Mm. Uh, as, as a sort of mental out-of-body experience that I have to start perceiving my life from the other corner of the room because mm. I have dissolved my ego. Yeah. Uh, so if we're talking about egotism and things like that, yeah, then, then we should be on the lookout for when self-respect just becomes something else mm. that loses also the same kind of either respect, compassion, or love for the other. So reciprocity is an important idea for me here. Um, but it's just really whatever word suits you best yeah. I know that's good that was really good good um, answer and to think it about it still so thank you <laughs> thank you next so I ask a question or an observation comment please go and talk to Ben because you can't I was going to hear you Just say who you are. Yes, hello, I'm Philip. Um, I particularly resonated with your idea of the future self. And for me, I was thinking of that kind of mechanism or connection on a bigger scale with regards to the... Um, the future self as the biggest self there is, which is the future of the planet. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking of when you were talking about that individually and the relationship of yourself with the potential future self. I was expanding that notion and wondering if you could say anything about the connection of humans with positing a future self on a global scale. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. It's, I think it's a very, very pertinent question. And uh, I tried to condense several ideas, but uh, they could all be expanded a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, there's many things in there. Traditionally, in the text, when they invoke this idea of because you love yourself, you do that which will be good for your future self, most of the times they actually speak. So it's leaping into just take care of your future life and things, your future life is not really you, then it's effective like another person. So just treat others, including your future life kindly um, and the connection to me is that rebirth for me is the old-fashioned way of thinking about humanity in this bigger scale where we now have the lens because we we have a discipline called history that makes big lens have that that much, probably the Vedas uh, recount somehow the story of the people. But um, the way I try to understand it, it's basically continuity. So I certainly come from a past life, well, at least two, my father and my mother, etc. Et some traits are inherited from a past life called my mother and my father, etc., uh, etc. Et and when I die, either whether I have a son or not, but I will leave something behind. So my future self is also my children or the people who are affected by my actions, just as my future self, in terms of individual self, is shaped by what I do in the present. So, short answer, yes. 
<laughs> I think you can think of this in terms of the planet and the future generation. And it's rather helpful. Thank you. Next person, either here or in Wales. What, New Zealand or Wales, who wants to speak next? Wales has unmuted. Um, hi, everybody. Really good to see you again. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm sorry I missed the first part. So I feel I will, I will um, listen to it as soon as Randy puts it um, in the air, in the sky, wherever it is. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I was very interested about just what you said now about future self and the question about the planet, because the, the, as we all are very aware, uh, this is a, a huge challenge for, for us, um, as we all know, the gratitude we're being led by, in many ways, by very young people of 16 and thereabouts who are really making their, you know, what they want to need. And, yeah. um, yes, and so I've been owned. Um, yes, I think, okay, I think. I, I thank you, and there's a lot, there's really a lot for me to think about and uh, work with. So, thank you. Hmm. Thank you, thank you for the comments. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite nice to see uh, younger people really <laughs> starting to do something about this because they are going to be more affected. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's an interesting movement. It'll be nice to see where it goes. But I, I, I think, or at least I hope, that the Dharma will have uh, a lot to say in this. And there's certainly a huge resource of teachings on dealing with grief, which has a particular role in what drive, uh, drove us here. Uh, so I hope we make use of that. All right. Yeah, the other speaker. Bon dia. Uh, Renat, how are you? Um, I'm fine. A little sleepy, but I'm fine. <laughs> uh, my question is about the idea of the not self. And of course, you know, there's parts where it says, you know, there is no self, but in some conventional Western teachings of Buddhism, there's the idea that there is no self. And I guess I, I'm interested in whether or not you could expand a little bit on that, because, of course, sometimes you see in a lived experience, uh, you might notice that you have, you're different from who you were in the past, that you're not the same person as you were in the past. So your lived experience might be that um, yourself is a temporary thing that is is there for a while and then changes over time. I guess I'm just wondering if you could expand or, or, or talk a little bit more about the idea that there is a self or how that interplays with your discussion of self-respect. Well, this is a huge topic and <laughs> um, it'll have to be the last question because I have to go and catch a plane. Um, <laughs> and it, it's a, it's a it's a huge topic, and I think the closest to how I understand the teachings is the idea that we have no fixed self, and and that's the whole point. We don't have an abiding, unchanging essence, which is really the idea that the critique of the self tries to get at. That the point of the self is that it's the stable point that doesn't change. It's like Sheldon's spot in the Big Bang Theory. That's, that's the spot of constancy that, men, that is secure. Everything is chaos, but it is there. Now then to think of a self that changes doesn't make the same sense. So, and then you get the conclusions, there is no self if this is your concept of self. Um, but in terms of not self, it's good to read about the historical context and what notion of self the Buddha was really refuting. But uh, most often the passage on not self 
like the passage in the second, apparently the second discourse of the Buddha, the discourse on the characteristic of not self, doesn't use the phrase, there is no self. It uses three phrases. This is not mine. This is not what I am. This is not myself. And, and just, just to reply shortly, I think the main ideas behind this is that for something to be mine means that I can control it. That's why um, if this is my watch, I can throw it, it's mine. But I cannot throw your watch because it's not mine. And then you realize that you cannot really control your experience in this way. So does it make sense to think of it in terms of this is mine? Maybe not that much. Then the second one, this is what I am, is about, I think, definition and restricting yourself to something. And it's where you go, this is all that I am. When you have a problem, a thought, a feeling, etc., we kind of reduce ourselves to one thing. And then the third one is kind of intensify this and think, and this is the way it has to be forever. But then, as you have said, you realize that you change over time and you're not the same person that you were. So these are to me the main ideas on not self. Not the question of whether a self exists or doesn't exist. To me, it's not a doctrine so much as a practice. And the practice is that of having an impersonal outlook on my experience, which is a usual Vipassana instruction, is that you regard things, and that's an action, you regard things in a particular sense as not being something you control, not being something necessarily that defines you. Your experience is not a commentary on who you are, and things are not set in stone. And you just, instead of thinking in personal terms and in terms revolving around myself, you just think in terms of the contents of experience themselves. You just see, oh, thought, oh, feeling, oh, expectation, oh, despair. <laughs> this is what there, yeah, this is how it feels, this is what led it to be here, this is how it ceases, this is what feeds it, this is what makes it better, etc. So it's a practice to me. And I think on, on that note, Bernat, I think we should say uh, good morning to you, good night from New Zealand, mm -hmm. and also good night to, or good morning to uh, Lorna in Cardiff. And we will talk in, both of us. And thank you for coming with us. Thank you for being with us. I hope you thank can. You <laughs> and thank you very much for your teachings. They were, were wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.